Long book, turn to 485. <clears throat> After this song, Brother Steve will lead our minds in our opening prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And oft escape the tempter's snare By thy return, sweet hour of prayer Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer The joy I feel, the bliss I share Of those whose anxious spirits burn With strong desires for with such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him. 
Him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace. I'll cast on him my every care and wait for the sweet hour of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come here once again this evening to study another portion of thy word and to worship you. And we pray, Lord, that the things that we do and the things that we discuss this evening will have your blessing and be in accordance to thy will. We pray that we will worship you in spirit and truth and know that that you will be with us as we discuss your word to help us to understand what we need to know. We thank you, Lord, for allowing our sick ones to return this evening. It's been a while since we've all been here t together, and we thank you for all of the prayers that you have answered in their concern. We pray that you will be with those that can't be here this evening. We pray that you will be with those that are traveling and keep them safe. Anyone that might be sick in spirit, we pray that we'll be able to bring them back to you. We ask as we go through this service that you direct our minds and we focus on the things going on inside here. Forget about what's going on outside these walls so that we may absorb and be edified by your word and, and the songs we sing. We pray that you'll forgive us when we sin. Give us the strength and the wisdom and the courage to resist temptation. For it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> Two hundred sixteen, two one six, <clears throat> two one six. Here we are, but straying pilgrims, here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, Soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrim's lurking foe, but the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. If you want to go ahead and mark the invitation song, it'll be 454. <clears throat> it's the one I always pick when I don't have time to look through the book. 
invitation will be 454. The song before the scripture reading will be 286, 286. And after this song, Brother Joseph will bring the scripture reading and then Brother Patrick will bring the sermon. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, Trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. The scripture reading this evening will come from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy uh, creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, for the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Thank you, Brother Joseph, for the scripture reading. Of course, this lesson is titled, In the Days of Thy Youth, and this verse does focus around youth. But this lesson, all of us can get something out of it. I hope we can. <clears throat> it's good for us to remember God in our youth, to have a good start to our entire life. Um, Joseph obeyed the gospel young. Josh obeyed the gospel young. And I know there were others um, that have. And it's good for us to do that. Not everybody is able to. Um, because not able, not everybody understands and not everybody accepts. Um, I didn't obey the gospel until October 13th, 2002. I was um, a little bit older than Joseph, um, and there's others that don't obey until they're further into adulthood. Um, but no matter when we obey, we're still called babes in Christ. We're still young spiritually. So whether we're young physically or young in the faith, we're young. And we need to understand what it is for youth. And 
Uh, there's a lot of things, characteristics of youth that some of us still carry on even into older age. Psalm 71 verse 17 says, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. And this is uh, David speaking. And this is a wonderful thing. And we should recognize God's wondrous works. And hopefully we recognize them from a young age all the way on. But again, not everybody's going to. There are some things that we need to know from our youth. And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. These things are beneficial for our youth, but again, also for those that are older. So the first point, in the days of thy youth, learn what it means to be principled. Being principled means that you decide to do what is right for the mere fact that it is right. It means not being influenced to do the wrong thing based upon emotions. A lot of people in today's society do things simply based on emotions. They don't look at the facts. They don't look at anything but emotion. They don't make decisions based on um, anything other than emotion. It's a feel-good society. Whatever makes you feel good, let's do it. Drinking, smoking, doing drugs, fornication, lying, cheating, stealing, as long as you don't get caught. Many do these things simply because it makes them feel good. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, and we're going to look at an example of someone who was principled. Hebrews chapter 11. This is speaking of Moses. <clears throat> it says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. What do we know about the Israelites at that time? They were in captivity in Egypt. They were suffering. They were being beaten. They were slaves. Choosing rather than suffering affliction, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to what? Enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What position did Moses hold? By proxy, he was the prince of Egypt because he was cast into the river in a basket and the princess of Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh, took him in. He could have spent that time in luxury. But instead, he found out that he was a child of the Hebrews and he chose rather to suffer affliction when he got older with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He knew that it was temporary. And so he gave all that up. This is likened unto Christ. Christ gave up the pleasures and the joys of heaven to come down here to give all that up so that he could die on the cross for us. It means uh, being principled means not being influenced to do the wrong thing because of friends. We all need and want friends. We want to be accepted of our friends, by our friends. Friends can be a good influence on our life, but friends can also influence us in the wrong way. It's important that we influence our friends for good, but not allow them to influence us for evil. It's a two-way street. Either they can influence us for evil, or we can influence them for good. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, according to the American Standard Version, Be not deceived, evil companions corrupt good morals. Being principled means not being influenced to do the wrong thing because of one's environment. How many times have we heard somebody in the prison system today blame where they're at because of society or because of their parents or because of this or that. That's blaming the environment. There are all kinds of troubles in the world today. Each one of us will experience our share of suffering 
pain, difficulties, especially our youth, because they're starting out younger. They're going to run down that path. It's quite tempting to let the storms of life sweep you away from your moorings, to give you a shipping reference. Losing faith or giving in to some temptation to do wrong isn't going to solve any problems. It's only going, um, it is only resolute endurance, steadfastness, patience, and long-suffering that will see you through. Think about the example of Job. Let's turn to James chapter 5, if you would. James here speaks of Job, and most of us know the account of Job and all the things that he suffered and went through, but he endured in the end, and he was rewarded by God. James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 says this, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, and the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Job suffered all of that that he went through, but in the end, because he didn't give in to all that temptation, the Lord rewarded him. We can learn from that. God has promised that if we endure, he will take care of us. But first, we have to go to him. Second, and the point here says, listen to your parents and grandparents. After thinking about it, I might change this a little bit. We know that as parents and grandparents, we're not always right. And if we can't admit that, then we've got something wrong with us. We are not always right. This kind of takes me back to our scripture reading, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon the most wisest man on the earth, because he was given wisdom by God. He was told by God, you can ask for anything of me. He could have asked for riches. He could have asked for any number of things, but he asked for wisdom to rule God's people. And God gave him that. So I might change this to listen to the wisdom that surrounds you. Because this one could go to any of us in here, no matter how old we are. Because even when we get older, there's wisdom in those that are our peers, those that are younger than us, and there are even people that are older, no matter how old we are, that we could listen to the wisdom. But whether we're talking about our parents, our grandparents, or just the wisdom that's around us, if we're talking about the parents and grandparents, they've been there. They've walked down that road, that path that you haven't walked yet. To be young is to have that feeling of being alive. You have energy. You want to go places. You want to do things. One wants to experience all the riches of life, take in all that experience, see the sights. But your parents and your grandparents know that feeling because they've been there. They were your age once. They know what you're thinking. You may think they don't because you think I, you're too old. You don't remember. But they've been there. They know. And if you don't want to take their word for it, take somebody else who's the same age or older that you know and go ask them, talk to them, because they've been there. They know. They've walked that path. There's not a desire that you have that somebody that's older hasn't had. They know. There's a, this is a hard concept to understand until you have experienced it. There's a lot of things that I didn't know when I was younger, when I was a teenager, that I know now as an adult, and now that I'm a parent. There's a reason why your parents tell you no, or put limits on your activities and your experiences. Kids need boundaries. I remember when I was going into uh, education for my master's degree, and they told us that children want boundaries. They're going to kick back, but they want boundaries. And as a parent, as I get further along and my kids get older, it's hard for me to see that kids want boundaries. Because there's a lot of kickback. But... 
kids need boundaries, whether they want it or not. Kids need boundaries. Because as parents, it is our job to protect our children. And this world is a vicious, cold, hard world. And they don't know that. But we do because we've walked down that road. Colossians 3 and verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 says something very similar. And it's not that God wants to be mean to children in telling them this, but it's that that God understands and knows that children can't take care of themselves, but God needs somebody to take care of the children. And that's the role of the parents. Parents need to provide for the children. Parents and grandparents know the consequences of poor choices because they've made them. And not just because they've seen them by other people. That was one of the great things of being the youngest with me growing up. My brother and sister made poor decisions and I learned from their mistakes. I didn't get in a lot of trouble because I learned from my brother and sister's mistakes. But we know the consequences of poor choices. We've been there. We've walked down that road. Even though I was the youngest and I learned from my brother and sister, that doesn't mean I didn't make poor choices growing up. It's very important to consider the consequences of our choices, our actions, whether good or bad. Good and bad choices have consequences. It's not easy to know the consequences of our choices if we've never made that choice. If we've never walked down a certain path before, we don't know what's going to happen. But it's good that we've had parents and grandparents that have been there or have seen somebody else go that way. God gives us parents in part so that they can tell us what will happen as a result and help guide us. Perhaps your parents have made some of these poor choices. I don't know of anyone who hasn't. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, if you would. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And these were written by Solomon as well. Again, wise man. He writes these in the form as if he's writing to a son, but these could be for a son, daughter, anybody who's willing to listen, very wise sayings. Verses 1 through 4, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. God wants us to remember his word, his sayings, and if we are true, good, faithful Christian parents and grandparents, then we are teaching God's word to our children. And I'll be the first to admit that I have failed a lot of times in my family. I haven't done this the way that I should, 100%. Grandparents and parents have wisdom that comes from experience and observation. They have experienced and seen more life and people than our young people have. As you grow older, you learn how other people think and react to life. While we're in Proverbs here, let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. Beginning in verse 20. It says, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. I've talked before in Bible class about the song that we sing, Here I Raise My Ebenezer, or Stone of Hope. If we are good, faithful Christians, we don't need a literal stone or cross or anything to rub on and help us to remember God. 
but we truly put God's Word in our heart and we meditate on it and we remember verses that help us, we put it in our heart, that should be our Ebenezer. And if I'm speaking directly to the young people today, study God's Word, memorize God's Word, and let that be your guide and your lamp in this dark world. Third, in the days of thy youth, treasure the moments that you have, because you can't go back. And that's probably one of the biggest things that we can point out, is there's going to be some things that you have regrets about. You're going to do things. You're going to leave things undone. You're going to have regrets. Some things you need to let go of, and you need to move on. But you can't go back, so you need to treasure the moments that you have. There's certain points in your life where you step over a threshold, and you won't be able to cross again. Getting your first job, getting married, having children, even the passing years move your life onward to a point where you'll never return. Friends, you know, you now know, will move away. Brothers and sisters will grow up and move out. People you know will die and pass away. There's friends that I've had in high school, and I'm still fairly young. There's friends that I've had in high school that are dead and gone. And I wish that I had talked to them more. I wish I knew them better. You will never quite be able to recapture the experiences of your youth. James 4 and verse 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Don't wish your life away. When I was in school, myself and my friends used to say, I wish this or I wish that about the future or even right then about my life. People used to say, don't wish your life away. And we shouldn't. There's something to be said about treasuring the moments that you have right now. Philippians 4 and verse 11 says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, I am therein to be content. Matthew 6, 34, Be not therefore anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We need to make the most of our opportunities. It's said that opportunity only knocks once. Sometimes it's hard to see opportunities. Some opportunities are inconsequential. Others, however, only come once in a lifetime. Turning down a good opportunity will result in regret. And again, there's going to be some regrets. Perhaps most importantly are the opportunities we have to do what is right. Galatians 6 and verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You'll never regret having done something good for somebody else. The most important good thing that you can do in this life is obeying the gospel and making your soul right with God. If you have not done that this evening, you have that opportunity to come before man, confess your faith, because we won't know that you believe unless you confess. Like the Ethiopian eunuch Philip said, unless he confess, he said, here is water, what doth hindereth me from being baptized? And he said, if you believe, you mayest. And he confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, and he was baptized. They both went down in the water, and the Ethiopian eunuch was buried. And he came out of the water rejoicing and went about his way. You too can rejoice today if you believe and submit to baptism and are willing to submit to the wisdom of God that we can read about in the Bible, that we can study about, and willing to commit your life to God. Not any of us that are adults here today that claim that we may know it all, because we don't. 
but to God himself and in his word. If you are a Christian and you've fallen away, you can make your life right because there is a judgment day coming and one day we're going to stand before Christ, the judge of us all, and we want to be able to hear those words, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, and not the words, depart from me, I never knew you. If you need to come forward and respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, you have, or this evening, you have that opportunity while we stand and while we sing. Today is the day of salvation, tomorrow may be too late. There's danger and death in delaying, except God's saving grace. His life on the cross he has given, oh come while yet you may. He's earnestly pleading, oh, make no delay, tomorrow may be too late. Today is the day of salvation, tomorrow may be too late. The judgment day, brother, is coming, prepare ye for that day. His pardon and mercy he offers, obey while yet you may. He'll save you from sin and bring sweet peace within. Tomorrow may be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. A home up in heaven is waiting. Oh, make the start today. Repent and confess and be baptized. There is no other way. Give Jesus your life and thus walk in his way. Tomorrow may be too late. Let's turn to 633, if you would, please. 633. <clears throat> if you were hindered from taking the Lord's Supper this morning, it's been left prepared. If you'll make your way to the front while we sing the first and last verse of 633. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, Demands my soul, my life, my all. Can you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, as we partake of this loaf that represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray that we will do so in a manner pleasing to you, knowing that it was his body that he gave up for our sacrifice. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can you bow with me again, please? Father in heaven, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, let us know that it was that blood that washed away our sins and does to this day. We pray that we will partake of it in a manner pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Closing song is. I think.
think it's 412. Yes, 412. We are closing song. Brother Charlie will lead our minds in prayer after this song. Let's sing the first and last of 412. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would here no longer stay. Though Jordan's waves around me roll, fearless I'd launch away. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore.